everyone. Welcome to Church at Home. Anyone else feeling like it's a little bit like Groundhog Day? Same place a couple of months later. But hey, whatever's going on in the world around us, it doesn't stop us worshipping God and opening His Word. Psalm 96 tells us, don't stop. Keep on singing. Make His name famous. And that's what we're doing this morning. So we hope you've got a coffee in your hand, a Bible, a notebook, and we're going to join together and worship God and then hear a great message from Pastor Colin. Why don't you join us as we worship now?
Causeway Church, welcome to Church at Home, Season 2, and um, last week we started a, a little two-part series um, called You've Got to Have Fun on the Journey, You've Got to Have Fun on the Journey, and uh, we started this, we, I found this, discovered this verse, uh, attended a conference, and uh, the, the guy speaking said, you know, church should be fun, and I found this verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 15 and Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament uh, we believe it's written by King David's son Solomon and uh, it, 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 the, the third the, 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 the divided kind into three thirds and the last third is about tools for living life and it's got this verse in 8 verse 15 it says I, so I recommend having fun who, who agrees with me because there is nothing better for people in this world and to eat, to drink, and to enjoy life. That way they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work God gives them to do. And uh, so last week, you can go back and watch it uh, on our link off our website or YouTube. Uh, fun, is an fun is intentional. Uh, we looked at being fun, how fun is spiritual. Uh, we looked at fun being relational. And we looked at fun being attractive. Nothing better than having fun. Nothing better than having fun in life, in marriage, in family, and work. Uh, don't just experience fun, you be the fun. Because fun makes tough times bearable. How often someone's in a hard patch and you might go and offer to pick them up, take them for a drive, take them down to the beach, get some fish and chips and tomato sauce. Uh, and kind of just change their environment, change their circumstances just do something to have some fun and often when you drop them back home they say man I needed that because when life gets tough laughter is the best medicine and uh, the Bible teaches that it lifts your spirit lightens your soul and in the Old Testament in Genesis God put in place a day of rest there were six days of creation and then a day of rest rest we call it the Sabbath and uh, so if you're in Israel on this day they will greet you with Shabbat Shalom, Sabbath rest, Sabbath peace. It's a day where you you cease from your labor and rest. You don't cease from having fun. You just cease from your labor. You do what you, you do the things that you love to do to have fun. And for Jewish people, the Sabbath starts at sunset on Friday night with a family meal. And Anne and I have been in the markets in Tel Aviv, and they're very loud and they're very vibrant. And uh, on the Friday night, and say sunsets at six o'clock, and uh, the the sellers selling fresh produce, they're they're arguing louder and louder and louder, and the, as it gets nearer to sunset, they go louder and louder, and the prices come down and down, and the chicken and the bread and whatever it is, and then as soon as it clicks six o'clock, is absolute silence, everything shuts, the shops shut, everything shuts, transport shop shuts, and and people just spend a day together with family and friends. Some of them will go to the synagogue uh, and they'll just have some fun and rest. Um, and then uh, a little bit later on, God put in place seven mandatory feasts and celebrations. And these are fascinating uh, to look at. The first one and possibly the most well-known one is Passover, the Feast of Passover, where the Jewish people remember being rescued from slavery in Egypt. And uh, you may know better the celebration for us as Easter, where we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus. In fact, Causeway Church's vision statement comes out of the Feast of Passover. There's four I wills in the Exodus passage, and there's four cups 
uh, at that that, uh, that represent knowing God, finding freedom, discovering your purpose, and making a difference. And Passover was directly followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then followed directly by the Feast of First Fruits, and then there was a period or a gap where we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, uh, then the Day of Atonement, and that's the, one of the most holy days in the Jewish calendar. The country really does come to a halt. And it's the only day that the high priest in Bible times would enter the Holy of Holies in the temple. And uh, then there's the Feast of Trumpets, uh, beginning the, with the Jewish New Year. And finally, the Feast of Tabernacles. And you can find most of these in the, Levit the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. And uh, the Feast of Tabernacles lasts seven days. And uh, so what's, what's really unique about those feasts is they outline all of history from the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, to the history of the church, and right through to the prophetic or the, uh, the end times, uh, the subject of called it ecclesiology, eschatology. And, uh, and, and these feasts always had a component of just celebration and feasting and like, to me, it's like a giant praise party and I've been there to experience one. No matter how busy people were, none of these feasts and celebrations were optional. The priests didn't send out invitations with an RSVP saying, hope you can make it. Uh, it was a command of God for the people to gather and remember and celebrate. And as I said before, Anne and I had the privilege to be in Israel during the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of the Tabernacles is one of the three festivals that Jewish uh, required Jewish men to return to Jerusalem to, to, to the temple to celebrate. The other two festivals are Passover and Pentecost. And during the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jewish people remember how their forefathers dwelt in the wilderness on their way to the Promised Land after the exodus from Egypt. And thousands of Jewish people come back to Jerusalem and they gather at what remains now the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall and, um, and thousands of households and businesses erect tents as temporary dwellings uh, and resemble the tents which the Israelites lived in in the desert. Even the commercial businesses, hotels and restaurants all get into it. And uh, some spend their time, some spend the festival actually living in the tents. Uh, some most observe most of them just often eat meals in the tents, and uh, we, we ate meals at restaurants in the, in the tabernacle tents. Um, and that feast lasts for seven days, and on the final day, it's, 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 it's a holy day, and uh, everything can shut. And we were running a friend who had helped us uh, show us through Israel. We, we were driving her to the airport from Tel Aviv to Ben Gurion Airport, which is about 20 minutes, uh, say Mangawai to Wellsford. And... Uh, and I remember being on this motorway, I think uh, might have been four, five, six lanes of motorway and not one car, just nothing. And uh, it's also a day of celebration where you'll see, uh, and we saw this with our eyes, uh, the rabbis are dancing to this day. They carry the big Torah scrolls and they dance in the streets and the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament. And they dance in the arms and people are dancing and there's feasts and celebration and they just focus on fun. These were just giant praise parties, singing and dancing. So now if you've got a Bible, you may want to turn, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 8 in the Old Testament. And we read about a call to one of these parties. And, the, and why I put it here is because it was the Feast of Tabernacles. And Nehemiah is leading the charge. The people are working hard to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. The walls are broken. Uh, the walls are broken down. The homes are burnt, trashed. And everyone's working hard, cutting stones, carrying stones, huge, big, heavy stones that make up the wall of Jerusalem and the old city today. And this wasn't an easy time because they had opposition and Nehemiah had people who pretended to be his friends but actually wanted to take him out. And uh, But they had completed the building of the city and they could stop now and pause and before starting to rebuild the houses. And at this point, Nehemiah called the people together in the city and asked Ezra the priest, to begin reading the book of the law. Just what I explained before, the first five books of the Old Testament. And we're going to pick it up in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5. Ezra the priest opened the book, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them as he opened. And all the people stood up. And Ezra praised the Lord, 
the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And I can imagine right at that point it went really quiet. And it says, The Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understand what was being read. It really helps to understand. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and the teachers of the law, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to them all, This day is holy to, our, to the Lord your God. Now, when I hear the word holy, uh, or holy to the Lord, I kind of think, okay, uh, still, quiet, reverence, solemn. And, um, and, those, and those, those, those are good things, and some of the feasts have that component. And it's great at church even that we have times where we're just quiet, we're reverent, we're solemn. But this is what Nehemiah says, Do not mourn or weep. They've been in a hard place. They're in a hard place. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And they'd been, we been weeping because uh, when they heard what was read, they realized that the mess they were in, the destruction of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, uh, the destruction of the walls, the destruction of their homes, it all happened because of a, a result they turned their back on God and his word. Now listen to what Nehemiah told them to do. Nehemiah says, This day is holy to the Lord. Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. Now, you, whatever choice food is for you and sweet drinks, that's fine. For me, that would probably be KFC and Coca-Cola with sugar. Uh, and, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. What? This day is holy to our Lord. And as, we, as the scriptures were read, they would have had realized that this this was a time of one of the feasts that God had put in place, and it was the Feast of Tabernacles. And Nehemiah says, This day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's a really important verse. So think of the circumstances they're in, and do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I think that's a really good verse in season for, for Causeway Church and our community and our country today. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I'm guessing there were people who would could say, you know, Nehemiah, we're having a bad day. Nehemiah, this has been the toughest week of our, of our lives. Uh, Nehemiah, we're in lockdown again. Nehemiah, I'm fearing for my job. I'm fearing for my business. And there would have been people who there who didn't feel like going to a party. Have you ever had an invitation to a party and you don't feel like going and you kind of want to make up some excuse not to go? He's not asking them if they are in the mood to celebrate. He's not asking them if they feel like having fun. Nehemiah wasn't asking them. He's inviting them. He isn't inviting them, sorry. He's telling them, go and choose joy. For the joy of the Lord is your strength, not the circumstances. They were in a hard place, a hard situation. But Nehemiah is saying, you are to stop and remember and celebrate and have some fun. Remember what the writer of Ecclesiastes told us? I recommend having fun. He Actually, he says, I recommend having fun. There is nothing better. It doesn't mean it's the only thing. He just says there's nothing better that will get you through the tough stuff. We allow the joy of the Lord to become our strength. We allow the joy of the Lord to become our strength foundation who would like to see more joy in their life who would like to have more fun in their life and i think this passage teaches us it's a choice we have to make despite how we're feeling despite what's happening around us despite what's happening to us you see joy is not dependent the joy that he's talking about here is not dependent on circumstances joy is not dependent on circumstances we have to choose joy and we have to choose our attitude. So I just want to share three really simple but powerful points to help us do this, to help us have more fun in life, to help you in your relationships, to have more fun in your families, to have more fun in your marriage, 
more fun in your workplace and of course more fun in church. The first one, some of you might not like it, uh, let joy onto your face. Let joy onto your face. And the question is, what, what message is your face sending? Do you know that before you open your mouth, you've already sent a message to those in your airspace? What message does your face send? Is it sending a message of joy and fun? This is the person I want to hang with. Or is it sending a, 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 a message of misery and gloom? Put your fun face on. It will change your world. It will change the life of the people in your world. If you want to have more fun, check your face. You are responsible for your face. And let the joy that's in your heart now be displayed or show on your face. Mum and her daughter went shopping in a shopping centre and uh, bought some garments and the, the mother came out and said, did you notice that shop, that shop assistant gave me a dirty look? And the daughter said, Mum, you walked in with the look on your face. She just reflected what you were sending her. So simple, but so, so true. And the Bible is so full of physical expressions in honouring and worshipping God. It says, um, uh, lift your hands, clap your hands, lift your heads, stand. When God created us, it wasn't a mistake that the physical expression of our bodies was important. I'll say that again. When God created us, it wasn't a mistake that the physical expressions of our bodies was important. So it's great that God receives honour through physical expression, but there's a secondary benefit to you. Uh, your life will be different. Uh, work will be different. Family will be different. Marriage will be different. Church will be different. You know, at church we often, uh, when I, I used to teach kids' church, and uh, in fact I learnt the Bible teaching kids' church, and uh, we teach kids songs and actions and expressions and all sorts of things. But when it comes to adults, oh, we kind of just, no, we just park that. Or maybe you, um, you tell your child, uh, if you've got children, uh, go and tidy your room and you get the look. Okay, you get the expression on the face. And you'll say something like this, get that look off your face. Well, what about you and me? What do you think God wants us to put on our face? So I want you to remember, just put joy onto your face. The second thing we need to do is uh, we need to let joy into your heart. And this, this passage in Luke, I'm going to read from in Luke 24, verse 34. Jesus is speaking in the context of the last days and, and the lawlessness that we're, that we're now seeing across the world. And he says in Luke 21, verse 34, Be careful that you never allow your hearts to grow cold remain passionate and free from anxiety and the worries of life, then you will not be caught off guard by what happens. So he's saying, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when you see it starting to happen, and we're seeing it happen now. Be careful that you don't allow your hearts to grow cold. Just remain passionate and free from anxiety and the worries of life. See, everyday life, if we allow, can cause anxiety. And, and it can get on top of us, especially in the circumstances we're, in, we're right in this today. Um, John 10.10 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. And in that is your joy and your fun. And Jesus said this, I have come that you may have life, and that you may have life more abundantly. Man, I just see a whole truckload of fun in that. And Jesus understands the weight we carry sometimes. Jesus understands the daily challenge. Jesus understands there's times when we actually need to pause and be still and mourn and weep with those that mourn. But he also came to bring us life. And I tell you, when I'm weighed down with, with stuff, when I'm grumpy and tired, and I, I'm no fun to be around. But I can tell you what, when my wife's weighed down and grumpy and tired, she is definitely no fun to be alive to be around and alive <laughs> and uh, she's actually sitting just by the camera waving her faces uh, stupid faces at me right now uh, but this joy Nehemiah is talking about is internal the joy Nehemiah is talking about is internal it's not affected by the external because of the circumstances they were in and joy in your heart will change your environment and let joy onto your face let joy in your heart and the last one, really important, pray.
praise in your mouth. Praise in your mouth. Praise is a little different from worship. Uh, we kind of mix it up at Causeway Church of praise and worship. Simply praise is about the, uh, the attributes of God and worship is kind of directly to God. And Psalm 100 verse 1 says, Make a joyful shout or make a joyful noise. So that's really encouraging for people who can't sing. Just make a noise and make it joyful to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him, His presence with singing. And verse 4, enter His gates with thanksgiving. And if you want to break that down into the, um, into the he Hebrew, it means coming with extended hands and into His courts with praise. And as a church, as, a, as an individual, praise shouldn't be limited to Sunday mornings. Praise shouldn't be limited to a church service. This is such a powerful, important dynamic to, to the health of your soul. And I love uh, getting out in Anne's boat. And uh, I, I, I kind of regret the. it's only in the latter part of my life that I discovered the Kuiper Harbour. And I love going over there. I love fishing. It's such a, it's such a beautiful place. It's, it's, quite, it's got a raw beauty that the, the, um, the East Coast doesn't have. Um, you see the sun reflecting on the Podu uh, cliffs of the Podu Lighthouse. And um, that's another church we have, by the way, Podu Lighthouse Church. And, and just seeing the, the, the beauty, and I just can't help but praise God when I'm down there. Or sometimes we'll take Anne's boat and we'll go to the hen and chickens. And sometimes you'll see dolphins on the way. And... Uh, the bird life and we just switch the boat off and you listen to the bird life on the hen and, hen and chickens and just the tuis are singing and it's just uh, it's such in a moment and you just start praising God and I've discovered what when praise goes up the presence of God comes down and uh, and it's the, it's so important to our well-being to our physical and mental health because we we're all created to worship something and everybody watching right now is worshiping something or someone, uh, our choice is to worship God and praise God. Isaiah 61.3, he said, it says he gives them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. How cool is that? I just take a minute, uh, pause, be thankful, let my mouth be full of praise. Sometimes just even write a list of the simple things that we have that are so precious. Uh, that things that come from the hand of God. S Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. M oh, magnify the Lord with me. There's an invitation. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. The writer of the Psalms inviting you to magnify the Lord and let's exalt his name together. And uh, uh, this is what I've discovered. When I praise God, my God gets bigger. Uh, he gets bigger in my heart. He gets bigger in my mind. He gets bigger in my soul. And when we, when we kind of maybe go through a tough patch, um, we still got to choose that praise. Uh, you know, if I if I go through a tough patch and I don't praise, I, I find that God gets smaller. And sometimes I even have the ability to shut Him completely out of my life. And the weight of life just gets heavier and heavier, and the problems seem to get bigger and bigger. And, and, and praise gives you the ability to just to magnify God. So in conclusion, this, this little two-week series is a little bit left field for me. But I think if you can look at those passages in Nehemiah, Nehemiah take these three things. You know, let joy onto your face, despite the circumstances. Let joy into your heart, despite the circumstances. And continually have praise in your mouth. It will change your world. It will change your family, it might change marriage, it'll change marriage, children, workplace, and even church. And when we go into the marketplace, you know what? You're going to be attractive. Jesus told us to be salt and light. And uh, and, and people will want to have what you carry. And people will want to, um, they want to fly in your airspace because you will change the environment. Why is this so important? Well, because life is, uh, heaven and hell are realities. And uh, that feast I talked about, the feast of Passover, well, that's when Jesus sacrificed his son. They called him the Passover lamb. And what we need to do to, 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 to experience this joy is to invite Jesus Christ into our heart. We, we turn from our old life and we say, Jesus, come into my heart 
and be my Lord and Saviour. If you'd, if you'd like to know more about that, we'd love you to contact us. Just email us through, the, through, the, um, through our website and we can get in touch with you. We'd love to give you a Bible if we can and so, so you can start this amazing journey with Jesus Christ and Lord and you will know what the joy that the joy of the Lord can be your strength. God bless you.